Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm talking to someone who's been behind my productivity for a long time. It's Michael Hyatt, back for his fifth visit to the show. In this conversation, Michael and I talk about all of the different things that he's doing in the realm of productivity, from the high-level, macro-level life planning Zooming down into annual planning, goal setting, and achieving, down to focusing and achieving on a quarterly basis, and even his new hybrid analog and digital system for productivity. We also get down into the everyday practicality of implementing taking a nap, even. Yes, it's true. We talk about napping. This week, it is truly my privilege to welcome back one of the very first guests to the show for his fifth time. Welcome to the show, Michael Hyatt. Eric, I can't believe it's five times, but thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it's been five times in five years, even. That is amazing. Well, I always enjoy our conversations, and I feel like the time just goes by so quickly. It truly does. Yes, it, it always does. And, and, I, and I have to make the mention because I made it in the show where Jeff Goins was on. He was very proud of having beat you to the five-time award. So well, he said he'd even come back and, and break the tie soon as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's competitive in that way. He, well, and, and that was very much what we talked about. I have noticed that since I've met you a little over five to six years ago now, that you seem younger now than you did then, more energetic, more productive. You're you're really living out this productivity life. And I really think it has to do with a lot of, one, the things that you work on with your team and bring about and have created uh, macro th- down through to micro level planning and executing. And uh, I want to kind of take a quick trip through those things because some people might not be aware about all of the stuff that you have out there, to be honest. Well, Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about it. So living forward was what you came on to talk about last time. And this is really life planning. This is that top level, this macro yes. level stuff. It was your your new book you wrote with a partner. And give a brief synopsis for people about what that book entails. I think of it as kind of the long-term time horizon where you're looking at 25 years out. And rather than just kind of drifting through life unintentionally, achieving, if I can use that word, things that maybe you didn't intend to achieve, like bad health or a divorce or losing your kids or going through a business failure or whatever, being really intentional about what it is you're trying to create with this one precious life that you've been given. And so it it really outlines a process for that so that you can get, first of all, so that you can visualize what it is that you want in 25 years, what's What's the quality of the relationships? What do you want to be doing for work? All that stuff. And then mapping out a plan for how do I get from here to there? Once you do that, then you start to zoom in a little bit. And that's where your five days to the best year ever course and upcoming book, by the way, comes in, in terms of setting and achieving goals. Yes, exactly. So somehow, you know, the rubber has to meet the road and five days to your best year ever was the course. And now the book, your best year ever, which is coming out on January the 2nd, 2018. But that really kind of sets the one year planning horizon. So in other words, if I could make this year the best year I've ever experienced so that I could get to December the 31st or what, you know, whatever the end of the year is for you, what would have to be true for me to look back and say, that was my best year ever. And I've done that every year for more than a decade. And it's really exciting because every year I kind of have to, to, to up the ante to achieve and dream and think of new things on my bucket list that I want to accomplish. And it, it's really fun. It's one of my favorite things in life, but it makes goal setting really, really fun instead of this drudgery and this kind of ritual that most people go through where they set goals and they don't achieve them and they beat themselves up and they kind of get into this doom loop. Uh, Best Year Ever is completely the opposite of that, where hopefully as we practice it, as we get better at it, it's more like an upward spiral of getting better and better. And you and I have talked about both living forward as well as the five days to your best year ever, I think for three out of the five or more times that you've been on the show previously. So if anybody wants to do a deep dive into the benefits and even just the necessity of life planning as well as the setting and the achieving of goals and 
some anecdotes as well as tips and tricks about how to overcome and break through some of the common pitfalls when it comes to setting and achieving goals. I'll put the links for those in the show notes. The next step, however, is free to focus, which you came out with this course a year ago. And again, this is another slightly deeper drill down into being focused on a, well, I guess still on an annual level like best year ever is, but even more so quarterly and weekly and daily level. We can have grandiose plans. We can have beautiful dreams. But if we can't execute day by day, week by week, quarter by quarter, and make incremental progress towards the realization of those dreams, then they really just become a pipe dream. And ultimately, we get disillusioned. We get cynical about our own future. And so we've got to be able to, and this is kind of the promise of the course, achieve more by doing less and not just achieving stuff or getting things done, but getting the right things done, because not everything has the same value. You know, it only has value relative to those dreams and those uh, goals that we've set. And that becomes kind of a framework for distilling what's going to end up on my task list today so that I know for absolute certain that the things I do today are going to move me in the direction of my dreams and my goals. For sure. Yeah. I think the way that I would put it is there's a lot of good tasks out there, tasks that should be done and could be done, but they're not the essential tasks. They're not the great tasks unless you choose those certain tasks to to execute on because you've already done the pre-planning at either a macro level of your life planning or on your your annual goals. And so then you know what it is that's going to propel you forward towards actually achieving those goals. Well, that's right. And, you know, I know you deal with productivity. Obviously, that's your podcast all about that. But it's but it's more than that. Right. And I was doing some work this morning with our private Facebook group for free to focus. And and I get asked this all the time. I got asked this week and I, I decided to post on this inside that group. But how does free to focus differ from getting things done? Because, you know, I've used getting things done since it came out. I'm, you know, conversant and have used the GTD methodology. But I think the missing piece is what you're saying. And can I give you some of the results of a survey we did on that? Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think, I think this will be of interest to your, uh, to your listeners. But, um, of course, for people that don't know, you know, if you've been hiding under a rock and if you're listening to Eric's podcast, you have to know what this means. But GTD stands for getting things done, and it's a, a popular productivity methodology that uh, David Allen created. I consider him a friend. Certainly, GTD does work for some people, no question about that. However, in a survey that we conducted last year as we were putting together the course, we asked people who had read the book and who attempted to implement it how they felt about it. And only 25% of the people felt like the system worked for them. Now, when we asked them an open-ended question about, and we only asked this of the people that didn't feel like it worked for them, we said, why? And it really came down to one of three reasons. First, GTD doesn't provide a mechanism for filtering your tasks. So if you think of a task, you automatically, automatically put it on a list, and before long, you end up with scores of lists and hundreds of tasks. Second reason, they said they spent way too much time managing the system. So rather than actually getting things done, they were constantly reviewing their lists, trying to figure out what to do next. And because this can be so overwhelming, they ended up, and this is, again, their language, careening kind of from one urgent item to the next, and they also reported that they spent, see if this rings true, an inordinate amount of time searching for the perfect GTD software tool to help them get things done. <laughs> yes. And then third, people felt overwhelmed. These are, the, again, their words, overwhelmed, anxious, and even ashamed because intuitively they knew they couldn't get it all done. So they were in this constant state of frustration, kind of teetering on the edge of burnout. They felt like something was wrong with them because they couldn't make meaningful progress against their goals. And so when they thought of everything that was not getting done, that's when they felt ashamed. And I, and I would still contend that there's nothing wrong with GTD per se. It's just missing some key elements that Free to Focus provides. What are those elements? Because I know somebody's saying, well, okay, I've, I've, I'm aware of GTD. I'm not fully aware of Free to Focus. What is the difference? Yeah, I would say that, that again, we get really clear in the course about what your productivity vision is. Is. And this is the question that most people don't 
ask. The very first module, which consists of three lessons, is called Stop. Now, usually when you think about taking a productivity course, you want to go, 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 go. You know, how do I get in the game? How do I get more done? How do I achieve more, do more, all that? But I'm just saying, blowing the whistle and saying, time out. What is your productivity vision? We have to formulate a vision of where all this is going. Because at the end of the day, doing more, checking more things off your list is not the end game. That's a means to an end. I would contend that what we're all looking for is greater quality of life, more time with the people that we love the most, the freedom to really focus on the projects we know that will move the needle, the freedom to be spontaneous without this kind of overhang of tasks that aren't getting done, the freedom, if we want to, just to do nothing. That's one of the things I loved about my recent sabbatical in Italy. In fact, the Italians have a phrase for it, but it translates to the sweetness of doing nothing. Hmm. To be able to have that kind of margin in your life uh, to be able to do that. So, so the first thing I have people do in the course is to actually formulate uh, a vision of where all this is going. What would their life look like if they were productive in the way that they'd like to be productive? What would their life look like? What would it look like with their most important relationships? Then we go to a, a lesson on evaluating where they are now. And I've got a personal productivity assessment that's in the course that literally gives you a productivity score so that you can have a baseline so that you can improve it. Because in my experience, happiness comes from feeling a sense of progress, not from arriving at a destination. So if you know what your score is and you can make progress quarter by quarter, and I have all the people that are in my private mentoring groups uh, do this very thing so that they can see the progress and objectively feel like they're making uh, progress. And then we talk about, uh, in that same lesson, something, and this, to me, this, this was a game changer, and that's the freedom compass. This is the missing filter, in my opinion, in GTD. So basically, you don't have to ingest everything that's coming into your system. And so I divide all of your activities, all your projects, all your events into four zones. And think of this as kind of a four-quadrant framework where the x-axis and the y-axis, one is passion, what do you love to do, and the other one is proficiency, what you're really good at doing, and good in a way that's acknowledged by other people and that you can actually get paid for, okay? <laughs> so zone one is the desire zone, and that's where passion and proficiency come together. It's that place where you experience flow, it's that place where you're energized, where time seems to disappear, and where you really accomplish things that make a positive contribution to your business or to the world in general. The exact opposite of that is the drudgery zone. And we all know what this is. This is where you have no passion. You're not particularly good at it. You just, I mean, it wears you out just thinking about having to do that. And for everybody, it could be different. You know, the cool thing is that what might be in my drudgery zone might be in somebody else's desire zone. Like my assistant, Jim, like I hate managing my calendar making plans, calendar plans, planning trips, all that totally wears me out. That's in my drudgery zone. For Jim, that's his desire zone, man. He gets his geek on when he does that kind of stuff. So that's fantastic. I, I can tell you right now, having uh, interacted with Jim, he really does come across as like happy and peppy and like he is in his joy <laughs> doing that. And and that's not mine either, but I mean, he he handles it well. Well, and and that's the key, I think, to to building a company, by the way, where people are really happy and satisfied and engaged is getting people to do more that's in their desire zone and less that's in their drudgery zone. So it takes getting the fit kind of right. And there's two other zones, you know, like if you have uh, the proficiency, but not the desire. And so for me, this was accounting and finance. And I come from the big corporate world where I was a CEO of a pretty large company and I had to get proficient in the financial side of the business. And I had to talk to investment bankers and all that. I was really good at it. I just didn't like it. And so that's the disinterest zone. You know, that's where you experience boredom. And there's a lot of people that operate in their business in a lot of those areas where they're not fascinated, they're not motivated, they're just bored. And it's the disinterest zone. And then there's those, those areas where you have passion, you love it, but you're not just, you're just not very good at it. And so uh, this could be your disinterest zone. And then there's something, a fifth area that's kind of in the middle ground where you're not quite sure where to put something yet. And that's just your development zones. So like when I started writing, um, I didn't particularly enjoy it. I wasn't particularly good at it. But over time, as I developed 
that became in my desire zone. And it's one of the three activities that I, uh, I do on a consistent basis. So if you've got this filter, this freedom compass, and everything that's a possible incoming activity, project, or calendar item or task, you could evaluate it as to whether or not it's in your desire zone. And if it's not, it doesn't mean you won't do it. But the more that you can do that's in your desire zone, the less you're going to have to manage, the more you're going to be satisfied, and the more you're going to make a positive contribution. Does that make sense? Totally. This also has a lot to do with this phrase that I hear you say, which is that productivity is more about energy management than time management. And so you're, I think what I hear you saying is, is that as you're able to spend more time in the desire zone and definitely less time in the drudgery zone, that you're going to become energized or at least spend less energy as you're getting, quote, more done. Totally. Yeah. So when something's outside of your desire zone, it just takes a lot more effort. It takes a lot more psychic energy to, to accomplish. When something is inside your desire zone, it seems almost effortless. I mean, there's things that I do today when I'm, you know, I was looking forward today, coming on with you and doing some other things I've got on my plate today. I'm energized by that. I can't wait to get done. And I promise you, I'm going to finish the day having checked off the things that are essential on my list. Um, and this is another thing I teach in the course but it's something called the big three. But I only have three items on my list for today. Three, the big three that I have to get accomplished. No more, usually, no less, but three big items. That's manageable. Now, so many people so often create a game they can't win. They wake up in the morning, they put 20 things on their list, they have the big 20. They know in their heart of hearts that they're not gonna accomplish all those things. So they already feel defeated and a lack of confidence before they even begin. Then they get to the end of the day, and even if they've checked off 12 or maybe even 15, they get focused on the seven to five that they didn't accomplish, and they feel like a failure. And that's how they go to bed, and they're anxious and frustrated and all of that. But if you only have three things, and they're really the important three things, the three things that are going to move you towards your goals, the three things that are going to make a contribution, improve your business, improve your life, whatever, if you do that and you do that every day, 15 items a week, times, you know, the weeks in a year or how many ever weeks you work, that's a big dent in your universe. And it's immensely satisfying. I've been adopting this myself because, well, I saw you do it and I thought, wait, okay, only three things. And the the struggle for me was when I say three things, how complicated do I let any of those one three of the three become? How many steps do I allow? Do you have any insight yeah. into that? Yeah, well, you want to make sure that you're not putting projects on the list that consists of a gazillion tasks. Having said that, I, I make heavy use of rituals. I have a whole thing in the course where I talk about kind of the core four big rituals. So a morning ritual, a workday startup ritual, a workday shutdown ritual, and an evening ritual. Now, each one of those rituals consists of a number of tasks, but I never really think of those as tasks because they're kind of automated um, in my experience. So as I'm going through my morning ritual this morning, you know, I'm not thinking or referencing even the list. I mean, I know what comes next is just bam, bam, bam. And I knock that stuff out. I don't have to put that on a list. I just have, and I have this in my, as, as you know, we've created this paper planner called yes. the full focus planner. And I just check off morning ritual. I did it done. Let's get into that because the full focus planner is unique in a lot of ways for, for you and for others, because one it ties together all of the things that you talk about in Living Forward and your best year ever and Free to Focus all into the full focus planner. But what's what's also unique about this is it's an analog tool that's part of your hybrid digital analog workflow, and I'm fascinated by it. Well, thanks. Well, and I'm also a user. I should say that. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Well, yeah, so – one of the things, I mean, I'm a totally digital guy. I mean, I geek out on stuff. I'm the kind of guy that uses text expander and keyboard maestro. And, you know, I can write stuff in Apple script, not very well, but I can hack my way through stuff in Apple script. So I love automating stuff and I love digital, but I started having this kind of gnawing thing, um, in my, in my thinking that I'm kind of putting myself in the midst of the distraction zone when I'm trying to do all this stuff in a digital environment. So could it be 
that there are some things that are better done analog than digital. And I think, in fact, there are. And, and, and in fact, the science would support that. So that, for example, the very act of writing your goals down, not typing them down, but actually writing them down, impresses them upon your subconscious and your conscious mind in a way that you won't get if you simply uh, type them into something like Evernote. There's been a lot of studies done on this, and I quote these in the course, but um, the, the level of retention when you write stuff down is much better because just think of it just as a practical matter. You've got more of your senses employed. And the, the mere act of writing it down means you're going to re, uh, retain it, you're going to engage with it, and it's just going to be much more powerful in your life. Having said that, I don't believe in a totally analog system either. I can't imagine managing the complexities of my calendar, for example, in a paper planner. So I have and advocate what I call a hybrid system, which is I want to use analog where it's best and digital where it's best. I don't want to be distracted in an environment with my to-do list and with my agenda for today. I want essentially a daily page that has identified for me my daily big three, any other little trivial tasks that have to be done, and my agenda. And I literally write that out every day because it gives me a way to re-engage with my commitments and identify what's important. And I don't try to put, you know, quote, all the little rocks in. These are just the big rocks, as, as uh, Dr. Covey would say. And what we found is that we have now thousands of people using the Full Focus Planner. We have a uh, group on Facebook, a private Facebook group for all of our customers where they can share, you know, hacks and uh, success stories and all the rest. But it's been amazing to see how productive people have been with it. Are you part of that group? I am part of that group. Yeah, I, I was thrilled to be able to jump on board. At first, I thought to myself, really, like a, a paper planner? Like, what's the benefit here? But only as I took a look at the tutorial videos, did I start to understand? And then I went all in. I, I mean, I ordered for a year, so. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Good for you. Yeah. I I wonder... Um, I've I've also heard that uh, there's there's this uh, a study where not just the writing but also reading that our retention from reading a tangible but well I guess tangible we're still if we're holding a tablet it's still tangible but not in the same tangible way it's not you know it's not paper it's not you know and and I think you know ebooks have come and I I think in some ways gone a little bit away there there have been a a, fl a flood of people who are still. Instagramming pictures of uh, paper books that I see from time to time, and uh, you know, and I'm not say I'm not advocating one way or the other, but I am saying that for me, uh, I think not having the uh, screen in front of my face, the blue light blazing out at me first thing in the morning as I am sitting and refo refocusing and having the full focus planner as part of my morning rituals, I think that that. That analog system, I, I, I really do think that we don't necessarily understand even yet 10 years on with smartphone technology and even further back the last 15 to 20, how this technology is affecting us yet. So, Oh, my gosh. Well, I've been highly impacted by Cal Newport's work in deep work. And you're familiar with that work, right? Yeah, Cal was on a couple months ago. Uh, he's, he's an amazing guest, and he? I've interviewed him a couple times. But, you know, one of the things Cal talks about is, is just how this environment is kind of rewiring, rewiring our brains so that it's, it's more and more difficult to do deep work where we really stay focused and work through a problem and get to a solution because it's so easy to bounce over to social media, kind of get a dopamine hit and get distracted. And we're developing an entire generation of people that are very shallow in their approach to work. They just can't stay with something long enough to develop the kind of innovation and breakthrough solutions that, uh, that are going to be necessary, uh, in the future. So, yeah. So I think the analog thing is, is not the only answer, but it's part of the answer. Yes. And again, I don't want to stick my head in the, in the sand and say no to digital. Digital has its place. And if, you know, I'm sitting here in front of three computer monitors as I'm talking to you. So I'm, I use the digital thing. Yeah, I, I always look at it as kind of like Iron Man, where the digital is the Iron Man suit, but Tony's still a hero in his own right and still has to take care of himself. You know, it's this hybrid system. That's good. <laughs> By the way, one one book I should mention, and you may want to put it in the show notes okay. in case people are wondering about the analog thing. There's a book that 
my team and I read uh, last year and kind of as we were preparing for the marketing of the planner, but it's called The Revenge of Analog. And it's just how in many of these areas, like for example, I come out of the world of book publishing, but eBooks have plateaued. They've never gotten above about 25% of the market. And in fact, they've regressed a little bit in the last few years, a couple percentage points. And paper books have made a big comeback. But not just that, but vinyl records, board games, things that are analog, because as it turns out, we're analog. And we like the touch and the feel of real objects and real artifacts in our in our world. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, especially uh, you and I are of different generations. And there's this whole, you know, mo- you know talking about millennials and all that. I kind of get sick of hearing it because I, I really think that all generations have their ups and downs. And yep. we kind of, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth based on social or economic or political or even spiritual aspects that are current or relevant during each of those generations early formations as well as then through throughout their lifetimes but i mean there are there in in other words uh, for example i have a friend who his father uh is probably similar to your age uh you know 20 to 30 years older and than me and you know he got addicted to a smartphone and it, and it you know it's it's we're all susceptible in other words yes. there's there's no one generation is better than the other. We all have to learn to to deal with this issue it, that I think is not going to, you know, go, it's not going away. It's still not getting no. worse. So I hope there's some people out there like people at Apple that are thinking through this and and realizing that they have some social responsibility. And I have enormous confidence in their engineers and kind of their whole philosophy. But I, I think that technology could help us solve some of these problems. Mm-hmm. I hope so. Yeah, I, I even I go back to to hearing. I don't know when it was, but I I know that I heard at one point Steve Jobs wasn't really letting his kids use an iPad, <laughs> which is hilarious to me because he invented the thing, and you know now we all we see tablets all everywhere, and and the smartphone, the iPhone, kind of was the precursor to the modern day smartphone across the board here. So, so true. Um, getting back to the planner. I really like it being analog, but I also like the other way that it's set up, that it's quarterly. And especially for the fact that I don't know if you're familiar with the 12 week year. I am. Yeah. So it really feels like it's that next step in the same way that free to focus course uh, uh, is the missing piece to getting things done. The full focus planner is kind of that final evolution of what the 12 week year looks like in terms of having almost a full year's accomplishments achieved in a quarter of a year versus over a whole year. Where do you fall on that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I very much believe in the quarter system, the 12 week year concept. Uh, that's why I don't really place a lot of emphasis on the month to month. I mean, in our company, we do obviously monthly financials and all that, but we're really focused as a company on what are our uh, quarterly goals? What are our quarterly launch plans, what are our initiatives for this quarter? And then we go from that quarter to, okay, so what's going to got to happen this week? And that's another aspect of the planner that I think is uh, hugely helpful is the weekly review, which by the way, I got that initial concept from David Allen. Mm -hmm. So there is GTD kinds of stuff built through this planner. But I think identifying, for example, your weekly big three is a big deal. You know, it keeps you focused so that you don't get lost in a sea of activity and be so reactive that you get to the end of the week and you go, man, I was busy. I worked a ton of hours, but honestly, I'm not sure what I accomplished. Well, this weekly review and identifying your weekly big three is a, is a way to make sure that you you do achieve that. And of course, at the back of the uh, book too, we have you as you set up for the next quarter, the quarterly review, so that you can really identify what's important uh, for the next quarter and learn from what you've just experienced in the current quarter. The very first time that you came on this show, we talked a lot about morning and evening routines. How has the full focus planner affected your morning and evening routines? To be honest, it hasn't affected it a lot because I've been pretty consistent for a lot of years with those. But I will say this, because we have, as you know, pages in the planner for you to write down the elements of those four core four rituals. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to revisit and fine tune those rituals. So, you know, I'm always making adjustments and I, and I always say to people, you know, it really depends on the season of your life. 
you know, I'm 62 years old. I have no kids at home. I can spend a lot more time in my morning routine than somebody who's got, like I was talking to a, to a gal the other day in our company, who's got four kids, or excuse me, three kids under the age of four. Yeah, you know, yeah. if she can get any morning time for personal development, it's a miracle. But I just encouraged her. I said, look, don't measure yourself against what I can do. If you could get five minutes in or seven minutes in, that's probably a realistic objective. Yeah, it's totally but, subjective, not just in season of life, but in season of the year. Yeah, good point. Very good point. And so like when I was I was in Italy, um, as you know, because we were talking about it before we came on the show, I was over there for three weeks. So when I'm when I'm on my sabbatical and it was a, actually almost a five week sabbatical, but three of it was in Italy. That was a completely different morning routine, completely different program than what I do the rest of the time, uh, because I'm totally unplugged during that time. And when I say unplugged, I'm unplugged from work. I'm still on social media, you know, posting pictures from the, the, my trip, but I'm not engaged in any work. And so that by necessity looks very different. And I'm very intentional about that uh, when I'm away. And I know that you've been using your, you know, basically your same morning and evening routines for a while now. I know one of the other things that you're a huge promoter of is taking naps. And I got to ask, are you still doing this? Absolutely. I've been doing this literally since college. So for over 40 years, I've been taking a nap almost every day. I wouldn't say I'm 100%, but I'd say I'm 95%. And so it's usually uh, just 20 minutes, and I've trained myself over time to do that. And people kind of look at me that don't take naps and say, well, I can't even get to sleep in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I said, well, that's just because you haven't had enough practice. And even if you can't fall asleep in 20 minutes, there's huge value to just hitting the pause button and just closing your eyes and just kind of relaxing, being intentional about your relaxing. That all by itself, if you never fall asleep, will recharge you to some extent. But over time, I've gotten really good. I can fall asleep in probably 60 to 90 seconds. And I'm not kidding. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, like what steps are you taking when you do this? Because 60 seconds to a, two minutes or so, <laughs> I wish I could do that. I would take naps way more often. Uh, for me, it's at least 5 to 10 to 15 minutes to literally fall asleep at all. And then I feel like I'm down for a, a good enough time. But uh, I got to know your secret. Yeah, okay. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple hacks. First of all, I set up the environment. So the environment's got to be right. So and what that means at the bare minimum is I've got to have some white noise. Okay. So even if I want to back in the day when I was doing this in the corporate world, I'd put earphones in and I'd, I've got this little app on my iPhone called appropriately white noise. And I actually use brown noise, but I put that on. So that kind of mass out the environment, the surrounding environment. Um, I make sure that the environment is, is cool enough because I, I fall asleep faster if I'm cool, but then I always put a blanket on. And so then what I do, and this is, this is kind of the final thing, is I really focus on my breathing. Because if I don't have something to focus on, I tend to think about, you know, what I got to do this afternoon or what still has to be done or how something went this morning. I don't want to think about any of that. I want to be in the present where I'm not worried about the future. I'm not regretting the past. I'm just thinking about now. And the best way I found to do that is to just focus on my breathing and keep bringing my mind back to that. And over time, it's like meditation, but over time I've trained myself that I can just get into that zone very quickly and then I'm out. So 20 minutes, I'm assuming that's because you don't want to get into the half hour to 45 minute range where you start to go into a, a sleep cycle and then snap out of that and feel groggy the rest of the day. That's exactly right. And, and all the research shows that if you sleep longer than 20 or 30 minutes at the outside, you're going to enter into that deeper REM sleep where if you're snapped out of it, you're just going to be groggy. You're going to feel completely miserable and unproductive. I never get that. I wake up and feel totally refreshed after 20 minutes. And again, I've trained myself. I, there, there were times, and I still do this if I have like an important meeting that has to happen you know, within 25 or 30 minutes of the time I start uh, taking a nap. But you could use an alarm. But over time, I mean, it's just it's like it's like a clock. I mean, 20 minutes, boom, I'm, I'm wide awake. How does this work for you with working with your team? And I mean, do they know, OK, don't interrupt Mike. He's going into his nap time. Um, <laughs> well, well, first, yeah, it's a good question. Well, like, for example, yesterday we had a full day of team uh, training and then we went uh, bowling. And so we had an hour for lunch in the middle. And my assistant, this is pretty funny, Jim brings this uh, gravity chair 
that's kind of portable. And he has it set up for me so I can take a nap. And he said, hey, I've got your gravity chair in there if you want to take a nap. And I said, no, I think I just want to hang with the team because we don't get together face to face but once a quarter. And I said, I just want to hang with them. And so I, I didn't take a nap yesterday. But when I do workshops, I always have, Jim always brings that gravity chair and I always go out for 20 minutes. And then I'm raring to go for the afternoon. If I don't do that, I feel like I'm, you know, trying to walk through water for the whole afternoon. You know, it takes, you know, twice as much effort to get anything done. And you're working from home mostly, right? You have a pretty big setup there now or Yes. So so you have that atmosphere, that environment that's easily more set up because it's private. Yeah, it's it's very easy. But uh, don't let that be an excuse because I know that people are working in the corporate environment. Sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative. When I first started working at uh, Thomas Nelson Publishers, I didn't even have a private office. You know, I was in a cubicle basically. And uh, we had this library that was kind of this archive of all of our content that people only visited if they had to find a book for a reference project. I mean, people weren't in there on a regular basis. So I, you know, and other times I found a closet, but I would just go in there, turn off the lights for 20 minutes, fall asleep, get back up and go back to work. I know you're also using, because I've seen it and it looks beautiful, a, a standing desk. How often are you using that? Like, what's the ratio during the day of standing versus sitting or, or moving? Yeah. So I'm standing even as I'm talking to you at that same desk. But um, I've got about three of these desks at various places throughout the house, even in my studio uh, where I do Facebook lives and all that's a stand up desk. But I would say it's probably 95 percent of the time. Very rare for me to sit down. Often I'll go the whole day without sitting down. But uh, a lot of health benefits related to that. Not not the least of which is just how much more uh, attention and focus you have when you're standing. I know. Do you that. do that? I do. So, in fact, I'm standing at my desk right now as well. So <laughs> there you uh, go. I do have a chair behind me with like a footrest and I will uh, sit there and put my laptop there and I'll, you know, take breaks in between. Um, I think I could get more time in standing overall. I'll definitely stand when it comes to, um, you know, re recording podcasts because the energy. I mean, you can tell. Like, I agree. I'm, you know, it's it's just it's way different. I even have like a. Let's see. It's made out of bamboo wood. It's called X Stand. Uh, I was a, one of their Kickstarter people. I was part of their their original Kickstarter, and it's a it's a like a combination lock thing. It's two pieces of bamboo wood that are shaped like X's and have rubber feet on them at the at all the ends. And you uh, you can take it apart and walk with it, but then you can slap it back together, and it's perfect to set your laptop on with that on top of a, a table, and it raises your laptop up to standing desk. Uh, height. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. you know, kind of the next level in this, and I've got one client that's doing this. Uh, and I actually, I actually did this for a couple of years right after I left Thomas Nelson, but is the treadmill desk. So not only are you standing, but you're walking. Yeah. I'm trying to think of who I know that has that. I think Jeff Sanders has that. Oh, does he? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. So, so m my client that does it, I mean, he walks several miles a day and you know, he doesn't do it all day. But he does it for hours and it's just at a slow pace, you know, less than three miles an hour. And, you know, he's just able to burn off calories and uh, accomplish a lot of cool stuff while he's working. Well, we're talking a lot about this whole energy management or energy boosting when it comes to, you know, standing desk or taking naps. What about diet or exercise? Because I know you're <laughs> you're getting up there kind of like a fine wine. You're aging. But uh, those who are listening that are up there in that age or who are down near my age, I'm not that much younger. I'm like 20 years younger, I guess. Uh, Braggart. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> see, this the Jeff Goins coming out of me here. Um, what do you suggest? What, in other words, what do you wish you had gotten in line sooner in your life than the last, you know, five to 10 years? Yeah, this. So there's a whole lesson in Free to Focus that talks about this. It's, it's called Rejuvenate. And it really is about energy management. Now, just, just to prove it to everybody that's listening, when you're fully rested, think about reading a book and thinking about how much better your comprehension is than when you're tired and you find yourself reading the same paragraph over and over again because you can't focus. And that happens in every kind of productivity endeavor, whether you're trying to write something or create something or manage something or interact with people. When you're rested, You've got so much more energy and so much more 
focus and therefore you're that much more productive. So I do think that the foundation of all this is rest. And I wish somebody had said to me, if you don't do anything else, focus on rest, make sure you're getting seven to eight hours a night. It'll make a huge difference in your productivity. Now, this is the funny thing, Eric, but when I was at Thomas Nelson, we published a book by a woman who advocated getting by on four hours of sleep a night. She said, just think what you can do with all that extra time. Well, the problem is if you do that, it's going to take you that much extra time to get what you're getting done now because you're not going to be that productive. So that's where it starts. But diet is huge. What you eat affects your energy level. It affects your biochemistry. It uh, affects the blood sugar levels and whether or not you feel energetic. And so, for example, and I won't go into everything that I go into in the course, but if you eat high glycemic carbs, you know, refined sugar, refined flour, those things are going to make you sleepy. They're going to make you want to fall asleep when you shouldn't be sleeping. So for example, this is why when you go to lunch and you have pizza for lunch or you have pasta for lunch, you're probably going to be knocked out for a while because it spikes your blood sugar. So you get an, an initial kind of burst of energy that burns out very quick. It's like lighting paper on fire as opposed to eating proteins and low glycemic carbs, much more like lighting a piece of oak. It's going to burn for a long time and it's going to keep your blood blood level uh, steady. Exercise is one of those other things that's totally counterintuitive. People think, why well, I, I don't exercise because I just don't have the energy. Well, guess what? This is one of those things where that when you expend the energy in exercise, you feel more energetic. So if I'm feeling a little bit sluggish and I go out for a walk or for a run, I promise you my energy level is going to go up. I'm going to release endorphins, adrenaline, lots of good stuff into my bloodstream that's going to make me feel more energetic. So I think the the key to productivity in the 21st century is being very intentional about managing your energy. Waking up and doing some of my morning rituals, which now includes uh, actual physical activity, getting out and, you know, depending upon the season of the year, if it's uh, warm climate, I go out and I walk my neighborhood as the sun rises. Uh, if that's not the case and it's going to take me a few hours for that sun to come up, but based on when I wake, like I'll go to do, I'll go to the gym and I'll walk. But I have found without a doubt that every single day that I go do that, that I get up and I go and I physically move that I am priming the pump. And even though yes. I have, yeah. And so even if I've spent out, it, it doesn't make sense logistically. It, it's exactly like you said, it's counterintuitive. Oh no, I don't have enough energy. Why would I go spend more energy of the little that I feel like I, I yep. have to hoard on exercising? And yet what it does is it, it breaks the seal. It brings out that extra wealth or well of energy we didn't even know we had. And it, it really conditions us to have even more so the longer and more consistent we are doing this. So true. And you know, one of the things I, I missed for years is I was a runner and I ran in half marathons and 10 Ks and all that, but I wasn't doing any strength training. Oh my gosh, strength training takes it to another level. You actually can burn more calories and more importantly, you build muscle, which burns more calories than fat. And I, I find that when I'm doing strength training, I mean, it's really important when you age, uh, but it does a lot of important things. It, it, uh, it helps my endurance. It helps my flexibility. It helps my balance. So there's a lot of benefit to uh, doing both cardio and strength training. But if you can just do one thing, I mean, like you said, just get out there and walk, do something to move. And I'll even often say, okay, I'm going to sit down and actually enjoy my lunch hour for about a half of the hour and, and physically eat the food there you without, go. without a screen. And then uh, go out and walk for 15, 20 minutes just around the block or two uh, just to get, get in some more sun, another missing component often. These yes. Days. Yes. So true. Tony Robbins has this saying about, you know, if you want to change your emotion, get in motion. And I think it's really true. So a lot of people that are, you know, maybe discouraged, I'm not talking about clinically depressed, but they're discouraged or feeling a little down, a little sad, whatever. A lot of times that can be remedied just by getting into motion. Mm -hmm. and getting out there and exercising. Totally. Yeah. And and not even physically, but even like mentally doing something that, uh, you know, maybe it's a, it's a brain teaser or it's fun, something that's, you know, even 
as much as we were talking earlier about being careful with technology, even having a particular maybe fun game on your phone or your tablet or something that you can go to within reason with with uh, with moderation that could help. Yeah, just the, the value of breaks. Yes, sir. You're talking about having great mornings and having great evenings, but how has the full focus planner affected your weekends? Because I know you have a weekend optimizer in there. Yeah, you know, um, I'm a recovering workaholic. And what that means for me is that I'm never more comfortable than when I'm working. And part of it is is because it feels familiar and I feel like I'm accomplishing stuff and I can check it off. It affects my self-esteem and all of that. But it dawned on me several years ago that I'm not a human uh, doing, I'm a human being. And I'm, I didn't coin that, somebody else did, but it's very clever. <laughs> and uh, so I, I wanna be a, a human being and I wanna develop parts of my life that are not just my work. In fact, I was talking about this at the team training the other day. I said, you know, if you wanna be resilient, You've got to build more of your life than just your work life. And I saw this happen in the recession where a lot of people lost their jobs and their job was everything. And it was very difficult for them to bounce back, to be resilient because they didn't have anything else in their life to support them. And so to me, if you want to really be productive at work, if you want to accomplish great things, if you have big goals, then you've got to be very intentional about taking time off where you specifically don't think about work. So I have these basic uh, rules on the weekend, which is I don't think about work. I don't read about work. I don't listen to podcasts about work and I don't talk about work. Now, this is particularly difficult because I've got a couple family members that are in my business and it's very natural when we get together to talk about work, but we gravitate to that because it's familiar and we feel competent and we know what to do with ourselves. And a lot of times people get to the weekend even with the best of intentions of really relaxing and enjoying family time, but they gravitate back to work because they don't know what to do with themselves. So this weekend optimizer that's part of the full focus planner is designed to help you be intentional and to think through your weekend about what it is that you actually want to do with that uh, time. So I talk in there about planning out some of the uh, things like your rest, you know, planning that out. How much sleep do you want to get this weekend? Uh, reflections, another key component of rejuvenation. You know, how do I want to reflect? Do I want to go to church? Do I want to meditate? Do I want to go for a long walk? You know, in a park relationships, what relationships do I really want to focus on and really nurture, nourish? Who are the people I want to spend time with this weekend? Recreation. You know, is there some particular kind of play that I enjoy, whether for me, in my case, it might be golf or fishing, but something that just restores my soul, that that refreshes my spirit. But to come up with a little two-page plan, which is what we have in the Full Focus Planner, for this weekend, for most people, is a game changer. They've never been that intentional about a weekend, and they've never really realized that there can be a very full, rewarding life outside of work. I really think that a lot of what we've just talked about is going to be hugely beneficial, especially because it's... Not just something that people have maybe heard about before, but I think we might have given them some clarity and even some forward momentum or initial steps that they can do taking action towards what they really want in life. But I know that you can do even better than that by offering them the free to focus course, which you're opening back up again in a few weeks. Yes, I'm super excited about this. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that we've completely reshot the course. We re-engineered a few of the lessons that weren't quite as clear as they should have been. And so we've upgraded it. We think of our courses like software. So best year ever, we're about to uh, do version 5.0 of that course. Every year it's gotten better and better. And this is version 2.0 of the free to focus course. And it's a ton better because we've gotten a lot more client and customer feedback. This last year, I did something called activation workshops where I met with about uh, 25 people on a quarterly basis to go deeper in the free to focus uh, content. They've given me tremendous feedback. So it's, you know, all new, improved, better than ever. I'm personally, having gone through the course, really looking forward to uh, going through it again with the reshot material and the the reworked, uh, you know, next iteration of the software, so to speak. So good, good. Well, I'm looking forward to having you 
on board with that, uh, Eric. I think it'll make a difference. And I, and I should say that we only open registration, this is true for all my courses, but uh, we're only open registration twice a year, and it's only for a week. And people often ask me, well, why do you do that? And it's because I don't want to be constantly promoting. That's one reason. Yes. Um, I want to be able to turn from promotion to actually helping those people because we have a private Facebook group for our VIP members of Free to Focus, and I'm in there every day interacting with people, trying to help people. And then secondly, <laughs> we do it, I mean, it's just frankly a marketing reason. Um, we want to create a deadline because we know urgency drives decisions. And how often have you gone to a product that you could buy anytime, left that page open on your web browser for a couple of weeks and then just decide, nah, I guess not. And we want to force people to make a decision. If you don't do free to focus, that's fine. But we want to force you to make a decision. And so we only hope have it open for a limited period of time so that there's a deadline that can help you make a decision. You're giving away some stuff, though, like the that personal productivity assessment that's part of the course. You're giving that away for people to be able to to do that assessment outside of having taken the course. Uh, I want to direct people to going to beyond the to do list dot com slash free to focus so that they can take that for free. It's phenomenal. That assessment will make you maybe for the first time and stop and assess and say, how productive am I really? And where do I fit on the continuum of where I could be? And so on the one sense, and this is like, this is true of any GPS system. Uh, you've got to start with where you are and then you've got to determine where you want to go. And the assessment will help you do both. Definitely. I know that taking that, I was like, oh, there's some blind spots here I wasn't fully aware of. And that was good to know as I went through the course. So, yeah, that's good. And, and you can improve and you yes. get that sense of improvement, which yes, is exactly. tremendous. Yeah, that that analyzation as well as then kind of a, a quantification of saying, oh, well, now I know what specifically I need to work on because I didn't get a, such a good grade in this area. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So even even productivity people uh, have blind spots for sure. So, uh, yeah, Michael, I, I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm personally, I'm looking forward to getting into the new course. I hope that everybody else that's listened to this at least go take the personal productivity assessment. Again, you can find that at beyond the to-do list.com slash free to focus. That same link will take you to the course itself. If you just know already that you want to join in, in the limited amount of time when it's open, I'll put in the show notes, the links to uh, all the books that we mentioned, as well as the full focus planner so that people can take advantage Fantastic. of that. Fantastic. So, Michael, thank you. thank you so much for talking with me for the fifth time. Uh, I don't know when we'll do it again, but maybe we'll do it in person or something. I don't know. But uh, five is a, is a great number to end on for now. Well, I'm honored. Always a pleasure. I love where your head's at and the contribution you're making. I'm a regular listener of your podcast, and I just you're adding tremendous value to the world. So thank you for what you do. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Michael. I know I'm always glad to be able to have the chance to talk with him and hit record. We covered a lot in this episode, but again, one of the simplest places for you to start taking action is to get a little bit more education about your own personal productivity by taking Michael's personal productivity assessment at beyond the to-do list dot com slash free to focus. If as you were listening to this episode, you thought of somebody who needs to hear this episode, head on over to beyond the to do list dot com slash one nine one and hit share. Share this episode with that person. Let them know about it or let them know about the personal productivity assessment free from Michael Hyatt. This is that next place to start to up your game in your own productivity and honestly to reconfirm you're not as bad at productivity as you thought you were. It's a double-edged sword in a good way, in that way. Thanks again for listening. I will see you next episode. Beyond the To-Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx.